handles are a cool hobby. When I moved to the UAE in late 2020 and imports became easier, this was what I ended up doing a lot. Given all the experience I've accumulated over the last year and a half, today in this two-part video, I'm going to put together an exhaustive list of what you should be buying if you want to get started with handheld gaming. Like at every different price point, what is the best option to buy? That is basically what we're going to be looking at and what kind of performance you can expect from these handhelds. Now in part one, we're going to be taking a look at pretty much what you should buy, be buying up to the $300 price point. And in part two, I'll cover everything about that. Hey guys, Ash here from C4E Tech. And if you do end up liking what you see here, thumbs up, subscribe, turn on notifications by hitting that bell icon. Let's get started. Now, before we start in this video, I'm going to be mentioning performance for different consoles using what it can emulate as a reference. To understand it better, here's the hierarchy. Going from the most difficult to the least difficult to emulate. I'll have this on screen to give you guys an idea of what kind of performance we're talking about. With that said and done, let's start with the $100 price segment. At this price point, the best handheld available it's got to be the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This one's powered by a Unisoc T310, which is head and shoulders above the rock chips you get on the Amber Nicks and Power Kiddies, which we will get to in a moment. What sets this handheld apart from most of this segment is this one's got Android, meaning you can tinker around a lot with the emulators, the forks of emulators. You can fine tune things to get it running just the way you want it to. It can run games up to GameCube, some of them at least. Up to the PSP, it's really good. It is worth keeping in mind though that while PSP performance might not be an issue, the aspect ratio might. This one's got a 4x3 screen, whereas PSP has 16x9 for the most part. So given that, what happens is you end up getting black bars to the top and bottom. But you know, for other consoles you might want to emulate, this works great with little to no black bars. It's got a crispy 480p 3.5 inch screen, which sounds weird when I say it out loud, but it is crispy for a retro handheld coupled with those nice buttons, a compact form packed to the flexibility of Android, a touch screen uh, as well. I mean, at this price point, all this together makes the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus unbeatable. Unless you don't want the flexibility of Android, you don't want to put together your own ROMs, and you want to say live in the gray, you want to just pick up and play, then you're going to have to buy a Linux and handheld. These ones usually come with ROMs preloaded. You're going to lose out on Android. You're even going to lose out on this level of performance because even at a $100, $150 price point, while you do have a litany of Rockchip 3326 SOC toting handhelds from Anbernic and Powkiddy, their performance is going to be a little lower. Now here, my pick is going to be the RG351V. Uh, if you like the Game Boy style vertical build, or the RG351 MP if you want a more horizontal layout of your buttons. The Powkiri RGB10 Max is also worth a mention if you want the larger screen possible, but for me, with retro games, the larger the screen, you know, it just looks a little bit more pixelated. I kind of prefer the three and a half inch screen. Uh, that looks better for me. But again, to each his own, right? Now these consoles, they sport the same chip inside, like I said, and they run on identical software. The selling point is the ease of picking up and using. Everything is preloaded. You just get, get it, pick it up and start using it. That simple. The difference between all these, it basically boils down to what materials are used, whether it's made out of plastic or metal, whether the keys are, the orientation is vertical or horizontal. That's pretty much it. They all have the same chip, the functionality, the performance is similar. They can all run uh, games up to Nintendo DS, which given the DS actually uses two screens, one of which is a touch screen, that's not really an optimal experience here. But they can also do a bit of PSP, Nintendo 64, but not very well. Meaning from a performance perspective, despite these handhelds being priced at the same point or even a little higher than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, the performance is a rung below. Why you are paying extra is for the out of the box pick up and play experience. Now, if you do want something smaller, then there are two options, the Miu Mini and the RG280V. I haven't used the Miu Mini in particular because, well, uh, I was buying pretty much everything that was launching. But by that time, by the time the Miu Mini launched, I'd gotten my hands on something that made me super happy, satisfied enough to not continue looking for that elusive, perfect handheld. That one, we'll talk about in just a minute. But right now, if you want that compact form factor, the Miu Mini and the Anbernic 280V, they both provide you exactly that. But they're also a little lower on performance. They can run almost everything up to SNES. So if you want excellent Game Boy Advance performance in a super compact form factor, then these are the ones to choose from. They both priced at around $60, so you can pick either whatever is available easier to you or just flip a coin, whatever works. Now, while on the topic of super small form factors, let me talk about three handhelds that are there are almost just novelty. The Powkiri Q36 Mini is something you can throw on a keychain. 
Same's the case with the Funky S. Both of them are powered by cheap all-winner chips and can run up to PS1 titles smoothly for the most part, but their 1.5-inch screens and the tiny little buttons make them a little more than a novelty. It's something cool to show your friends and that's basically it. At the $60 price point for me, I feel that's a little too much to spend on novelty, but hey, if that's what floats your boat. Now, if it's not just novelty, but you want something a little more, I mean, let's call it novelty plus, you know, the smallest usable form factor possible, then the Trim UI Model S, also known as the Pauky D A66, comes into play. It's still not very comfortable given it only has a two inch display, but it's actually usable unlike the other two we just saw. It weighs in at just 65 grams. The si it's the size of a credit card and it's a decent enough handheld for GBA. I say Game Boy Advance here because it has weaker internals than the Funky S and the Q36 Mini. So it can only do up to SNES, but given it is often available for about $45, you can't really complain. Before we jump into the higher, higher end segment, here's a couple of really cheap ways to get your GBA fix. The Pau Kiri Q20 Mini and the V90 both have similar internals and are often found on sale anywhere between $20 to $30. Guys, Pau Kiri's build quality, if you didn't know from the name already, Pau Kiri, I mean, it's very hit or miss. I currently have a Q20 Mini with a battery that ballooned just a month after purchase and it's not an isolated incident. You go on, check discords for various handhelds and you'll see a lot of complaints with Pau Kiri build quality. But for the price, if you want to say get your kid away from the entire freemium Android gaming model and show what an actual handheld game is, then these are good options. This is a good starting point. Okay, let's now move on to things that offer higher performance, but also happen to cost more. There are two clamshells that I usually recommend for various, I mean, totally uh, different reasons. First up, the, again, PowKD X18S. This is one of the more powerful handhelds that you can get. It's powered by the Unisoc T618 SoC. It can handle some GameCube titles and even some easy to emulate PS2 or Wii titles. But before you go ahead and buy one, there are some things to keep in mind. Given this is Paukiri after all, the quality control isn't too good. The sticks in particular, I wasn't a fan of. The keys are okay and the display is nice, but the stock software is pretty clunky. There are Lineage OS ports available for it, but the most important thing to note is this one does not have clickable sticks, so no L3, R3. Uh, not a good deal if you want to go Stadia or Game Pass or even just stream from your own console or PC. Now the other one here is the GPD XD Plus. This is pretty old, ancient at this point. It, it even has a hinge issue worth keeping in mind. So basically once you get it, you need to open it up and tinker around with that hinge so that it doesn't break uh, when you continue using it. So it's a little bit of a preemptive thing you need to do. It's not very difficult to do, but it's also annoying. Uh, something to keep in mind. It also has weaker internals than the Pau Kiri. So it's got a MediaTek 8176 SoC. It can handle some of the easier to play PSP titles, but that's pretty much it. Given all these cons, why am I even bringing it up? Well, that's cause this one, while it, while it also lacks clickable sticks, GPD has been sane enough to provide dedicated L3 R3 buttons, making it one of the better options to stream games on. So PC to handheld, console to handheld, Stadia, GeForce Now, if that's your thing and you like clamshells, this is gonna be the one to get. But me personally, I'd ask you to forget clamshells and get the other one on the list, you know, the one that I feel is the best amongst the bunch. We will get to it in a minute. Since I just heavily mentioned streaming, this next handheld, do not buy it. But if you have one lying around, don't waste your time looking for an alternative to give you a better streaming experience. The Nvidia Shield Portable came out all the way back in 2013, if I can recall correctly. And as of today, uh, one in good condition costs about 100, 150 US dollars. It is the most solid PC to handle streaming experience you're gonna get. And just look at the controls, just look at these sticks. It feels pretty close to an Xbox controller. This is the best in-hand feel you're gonna get with any handheld controller barring one. The issue with the Shield Portable is none of this. It's the fact that it's still stuck on Android 5.1. Some streaming services, like for example, Xbox Game Pass, does not work with anything under Android 6. There are a couple of custom ROM builds for Android 6, CyanogenMod Mod and Lineage OS, but they can be a little finicky. That said, one of the ways you stream games from a PC to a handheld is by using an app called Moonlight. What Moonlight does is trick your PC into believing you're streaming to a Nvidia Shield. And this is the Nvidia Shield Portable. This is native streaming. This is the most stable PC streaming you can experience. But for all the software reasons I mentioned so far, it isn't something you should be buying. 
But at the same time, if you happen to have one lying around already, don't bother going around looking for something better because it's old, you want better streaming experience. Nah, this is as good as it gets for PC streaming. Anyways, now that my love note to the Shield Portable is done, let's move further on up the list to what I consider the best, the absolute best Android handheld available at the moment. Meet the iNodin. If you've been watching smartphone videos on C4E Tech, you're gonna find it funny when I say, it's got a beast of a chip, the Snapdragon 845. But guys, these are handhelds, a world where till the Odin came out, rock chips ruled the roost. So this is the best performing Android handheld. With the Snapdragon 845, you can get emulation up and running up to PS2. It's got a six inch, 16 by nine aspect ratio display. And here's a fun little snippet. This is one of the most powerful devices with a 16 by 9 display. Look it up, every Android phone that, la that launched with 855 and above, they had a 18 by 9 display at the very least, meaning you will have black bars to the sides. The most powerful Android phone with a 16 by 9 display as of today is the Razer Phone 2. I mean, look it up, check. There is nothing with an 855 or higher that has a 16 by 9 display. So here, the 845 on the Odin, it should perform better than on any phone since Ayn has added active cooling. Given the Odin also has proper clickable analog sticks, it's pretty decent for streaming. I say decent and not amazing, because the sticks, well, they are a huge step up to what we've seen so far. They still aren't what you're gonna wanna go with, especially for games where you need to aim a lot. It's not really a huge issue, more of me nitpicking since they've done almost everything, right? That said, this is also the first handheld on the list that has analog triggers, which basically means it can read how much these buttons are being pushed and perform accordingly. For example, in a racing game, how much you press these triggers decides how much you accelerate. Now, while the Odin is the best Android handheld you can get, it is not the most expensive. The RG552 from Anburnic comes close. The GPD XP, which is an interesting concept, is much more expensive, but the Odin remains the most powerful one and is priced at $250, so it's pretty unbeatable. Beat it up, a newer Odin Lite is also on its way with the Diamond City 900. No, not 9,000, but 900. That has all the same goodies, but at under $200. Now before we wrap part one, let's also touch upon first party handhelds. You know, the ones from the likes of Sony, Nintendo, etc. Of course, the Switch is the go-to here. A jailbroken Switch can emulate the likes of GameCube and Wii quite nicely. But remember, very few Switches can be jailbroken and it gets very expensive uh, for the light and it's impossible with the OLED. The PS Vita still remains a very cool option. It's got a huge library of games. Given that Vita doesn't have any great emulators, this is an excellent handheld to buy. It can even emulate some of the lower end consoles like GBA and has native support for the PSP. I particularly love the OLED version. That said, here's a word of caution. Almost all OLED Vita screens will have a Mura effect. Basically, you will see black splotches when the screen's absolutely dark, pitch black. And it is not considered a defect. That's just how OLEDs were back in the day. It doesn't particularly bother me, but if you think it would bother you, then look at the Vita 2000, the LCD one. It's sleeker, it's slimmer, it weighs lesser, it's got better battery life, and also repairs are cheaper. For example, with the OLED Vita, let's say you wanna change an analog stick, it's gonna cost you $18. With the, uh, with the LCD Vita, it only costs you three. So that's another thing to keep in mind. The Nintendo 3DS also remains a credible option. It's difficult to emulate on hardware under $300 and is available for 100, 150 used. It gets you access to a huge library of 3DS games and has virtual console support for GBA and Nintendo DS. So you can still play a lot of excellent games on this. Uh, one of the reasons why I still happen to retain mine. With any console below this point, Nintendo DS, GBA, uh, PSP, you actually end up getting a better experience with emulation. Hardware these days is just good enough. As you see here, this is God of War on a PSP Go side by side with God of War PSP on the Odin. With the emulator, you can upscale, add anti-aliasing and so on to make the game look better. You also get save states and the ability to speed through cutscenes, which is an absolute godsend when you want to revisit old titles. Now this list cannot be complete without at least an honorable mention to controllers. Pretty much any phone you currently have should perform better than most consoles on this list. The most practical and inexpensive solution to playing on a handheld is to add a controller to a phone that you already have. If you're wondering which controller to choose, I have a dedicated video on that. I'll leave a card to it here, check it out. Also, if you guys do wanna want it, I can shoot a video, a dedicated video on how to have your phone set up as a handheld. So, you know, how to access everything using controllers uh, and even maybe what emulators you'd have to use. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. 
And before we are done, here's yet another honorable mention. This is a LCL Pi CM4. It's a Game Boy kind of belt, but as the name indicates, it has a Raspberry Pi CM4 on the inside. You can change the software it boots up based on the cart you add here. It's a nice little handheld, but not very price effective. Talking about the Raspberry Pi, if you own one already, there are a multitude of cases like this that you can get that will help convert a full-fledged Pi into a handheld. Again, it's much cheaper to buy a Ann Burnick or a Pau Kiri, and even the Pi 4 doesn't get you any major performance gains over something like a Rockchip 326. But if you already have a Raspberry Pi board lying around, this could work for you. Anyways guys, that's pretty much it for part one of this video. In the next part, let's talk about everything priced over $300 from more expensive Androids all the way up to full-fledged Windows PCs as, ha as handhelds. I'll leave a card to that video here once I'm done with it. In the meantime, if you did find this video useful and or interesting, before you go ahead and jump to part two, please hit thumbs up, subscribe, turn on notifications by hitting that bell icon if you haven't yet. I'll catch you guys in part two. Till then, Ash here from C4 Tech signing off. You guys have a great day.